Let's turn our attention to China-Africa relations. China's investment into Africa may rise by 2015 as the Asian nation scrambles for resources and continues to break new ground in South Africa's platinum belt. We see where platinum's Bakubang mine is China's first direct investment in the sector and analysts predict that it won't be uh, the last. Uh, joining us from our studios in Cape Town for more insight, Dirk Kortz, Managing Director at the Beijing Axis. Uh, of course, uh, Dirk, this isn't a, a new story, China-Africa investments, uh, but uh, the receipts where one was interesting because it was an investment into a struggling uh, sector in South Africa. Uh, what are your thoughts on that and the, 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 the fact that Xinquan, who of course has already a big stake in Metarex, is once again flexing its muscle in South Africa? Well, the normal mode of investment for Chinese uh, investors in Africa is that they prefer to invest in brownfield or operating assets. Uh, they prefer to not do greenfield projects for understandable reasons, the risks associated, the uh, technical difficulties and so on and so forth. So yes, Wissizwe is certainly unique in that respect. Um, and I think it's also, it, it shows some vote of confidence in the ability of this country in particular, but also the region as a whole, to receive such high-profile investments. Mm -hmm. but overall, uh, what's your sense as to uh, the shape and form that uh, investments will take further down the line? Because uh, this ultimately was, on, on the one part, the Xinquan uh, investment, a 45% equity stake, and then they also got a, a loan there from the China Development Bank. Uh, so, so what's your sense as to uh, China's preference, uh, Chinese firms or Chinese government's preference when it comes to taking equity stakes or providing loans? I think one can't yet say that there's a certain preference. One will have to wait and see how it pans out over the next five to ten years. What one can see so far is that there's much more of an appetite for uh, a, a wider range of investments. Um, uh, Chinese investors are becoming more creative, they are becoming more receptive to taking smaller equity stakes and different modes of investment, whereas 10, 15 years ago it was very simple. You had large SOEs who came in and tried to have control over mining assets. Those days are over. Um, right now the appetite is much more diverse and we'll see more diversity creeping in into other sectors, for example, into agriculture and industrials and so forth, mm -hmm. not just mining. What is your sense as to uh, why the Chinese government is investing in these, uh, in these companies? Is it because it wants the raw materials for its own growth, or do you think it's looking for growth opportunities outside of China? Well, a combination of factors. First of all, one has to say that it isn't the Chinese government investing. It is um, companies that may be partly owned by the central government or provincial or local governments. Uh, many of these companies do operate ar along commercial lines. So it is company interest, it is shareholder interest with an eye on what the government's bigger um, w uh, plan is or what the government's approvals are. Um, I think one um, should realize that the drivers in China, the drivers of these investments are not um, going away for quite some time. The Chinese economy may be slowing, but 5% um, growth this year in pure volumes is the same as 10% growth six years ago. So um, this trend will continue, and I think um, what you will see is just a wider variety of companies, perhaps privately owned, non-state players, entering the fray and um, making investment more um, as I said, more diverse and uh, across sectors and across economies. And you often see uh, Chinese firms investing in African uh, companies or g providing loans to African governments. Uh, they often come with uh, quite uh, competitive or attractive rates and uh, you know, called soft loans. Uh, is this a concern that they're giving out these loans which are seen to be attractive and basically uh, too good to not to turn down basically? Well, whether it's too, too good or not is a matter for the countries themselves to, to decide. I think one can't make um, any judgment on that. Many of the loans are backed by sovereign guarantees, one has to note. Um, and in many cases, these loans come with strings attached, for example, um, having to use Chinese contractors on certain projects, having to use Chinese equipment. Um, but once again, as China Inc. moves into Africa, they'll start realizing, and they are realizing at the moment, that to be successful, you have to engage the local economy better, local service providers, mm -hmm. local governments, local civic groups, and so on and so forth. So I think over time, the, the hard requirements that come with these loans will start to soften, 
as the Chinese authorities see that it's more in their interest to um, cooperate with local and other non-Chinese players rather than just having a pure Chinese play. And in the case of the Wasiswa platinum mine, uh, the, one of the requirements there was to use local labor and that of course, and also local suppliers and help support uh, the local uh, community. So that of course is a positive and that would make uh, governments in Africa more open to, to Chinese business uh, doing or investing in the country. Of course, yes. Um, the importing of Chinese laborers, for example, is a fairly contentious issue in some parts of Africa, other parts less so. Um, so it depends really on what the local government um, requires from Chinese investors. Ten years ago, governments in Africa were quite desperate for any kind of investment and they had very, very few requirements. Right now, Africa is a favored investment destination in relative terms and governments in Africa are becoming slightly more assertive in what they want out of foreign investors. That is a move in the right direction, I believe, as long as it has the commercial interest and the economic interest of the country at stake. Mm -hmm. Just looking at uh, some of the investments so, so far, just here in South Africa, I mean, for ICBC, uh, that's the largest by far, $5.6 billion, uh, that 20% uh, stake in Standard Bank. Uh, I talked about uh, Metarex and Jinquan, that was uh, just over $1.3 billion. Uh, and you talk about the fact that you're seeing, going to see a diversification uh, across sectors, agriculture stands out. Uh, what other sectors, apart from agriculture and resources, do you think Chinese companies will see an opportunity in, in South Africa? Well, I can't talk about the country in particular, but I, th I think one should talk more in African terms. I think low-cost manufacturing, for example, apparel, shoes, and so on and so forth, is already departing from China due to cost pressures, due to uh, wage inflation. Mm -hmm. um, those factories are moving to Vietnam or to Bangladesh, and in some cases, they're moving into Africa. Nigeria, for example, has almost a thousand, it is said, Chinese, small Chinese factories. But this movement of Chinese manufacturing into Africa is not driven by the Chinese government. It is really Chinese um, private enterprises, mom and pop shops who, who come to Africa and start manufacturing here. Later on, you may start seeing larger enterprises, SOEs, perhaps moving in to assemble vehicles. We're seeing some movement in that area, uh, machinery and so forth. So most certainly the groundwork has been laid in Africa in terms of diplomatic relations, in terms of the knowledge base amongst Chinese business people about Africa mm -hmm. and I think you would see more manufacturing moving into Africa um, over the next five to ten years.